Thanks very much, and uh, it is an honor to close this session of, of the meeting. I'm going to talk about type 2 diabetes, which I've been uh, driven to work on since I worked with Harry Keane in the 1980s and was struck by the injustice of this condition in, in that it affects many people, but its complications are largely preventable, and it's the biggest cause of avoidable blindness, end-stage renal disease, lower extremity amputation, gives rise to reduction of life expectancy of six, six years. So um, working in it clinically was important, but what I wanted to do was to work towards sustainable solutions to the problem, and as an epidemiologist, to focus on variation in this condition around the world, which is extreme. There, there are pockets and countries with very high prevalence and others where the disease until recently has been relatively rare. And there are many hypotheses to explain this variation, but typically uh, it's attributed to an interplay between our genetic predisposition, early developmental factors, uh, and behaviors and environments that, that we live in. Now, Explaining that uh, at a theory level is one thing, and demonstrating the molecular mechanisms that underlie that uh, is much, much harder. But then the question is, how are we going to use that information in order to do something practical? And that practical challenge is huge, because there are 425 million people who live with diabetes now, and 80% of them live in low- and middle-income countries, the very countries where the healthcare systems are not sufficiently well-funded to try and uh, alleviate the problem of the complications. And by 2040, there'll be some 642 million people. And for those countries where 80% of these people live, this is a clinical challenge, a public health challenge, but it's essentially a challenge to sustainable, uh, sustainability and sustainable development because of its economic uh, impacts. So if you want to study the interplay between uh, genetics and other risk factors, you first have to identify genetic predisposition. And the United Kingdom has been really terrific at uh, working together collaboratively to identify genes for diabetes, obesity, and insulin resistance. And that's a combination of collaborative working, the use of modern technology, and the application of that technology on scale. And I just want to show you one example, which is from work we've done on insulin resistance, which is one of the key underpinning pathophysiological abnormalities that leads to type 2 diabetes. And we've used genetic uh, techniques to identify risk scores that predict the degree to which people have uh, resistance to insulin. And on the bottom uh, right of this figure, where we put people into quintiles of how many of those common risk alleles for insulin resistance they have. So the people in this, this quintile five, they have a high genetic predisposition to having insulin resistance. And you can see that they have an increased risk of type two diabetes, which is quite strong. Now, if you go to a clinic, most people would think that those people with type two diabetes would be characterized by having central adiposity, most of the fat is in the abdomen, and that, they would assume, was the primary abnormality. Actually, if you look here, this is the leg fat mass in grams. And what you can see, actually, is the primary defect in these people with this common form of insulin resistance is actually inability to store fat safely in the legs, which means that in times of food excess and energy surfeit, that excess energy is deposited centrally because it can't be stored safely in the legs. Now, that has clinical and public health implications. So this is a patient I saw in the clinic with poorly controlled type 2 diabetes, despite really working very hard. She lost 35 kilograms in weight and was doing 10,000 steps a day. And I bet you, with the exception of John Todd, there's no one in the audience who clogs up 10,000 steps a day. It's, it's very difficult to do. And this is her DEXA scan. This is an image of where her fat is stored. And if you just compare this to the person on the right, who's of the same age, sex, and overall level of, of adiposity, this person has fat deposited here in the legs and subcutaneously, but this person virtually has none in the legs at all. She has an inability to store fat safely, and it then overspills into the, to the viscera and gives rise to her poorly controlled diabetes. Now, the importance of that for her is that that might give us some clues as to how to 
treat her particular type of diabetes. But what about the implications for this sort of risk when we come to populations? Well, if you want to study that, you need very big studies. So I've been fortunate to work on uh, very big studies started by people in previous generations. I worked on EPIC, which has nearly half a million people at baseline across 10 different European countries. And we did the follow-up and found 12,500 incident cases of diabetes from nearly 4 million person years of follow-up. Big team effort. Uh, first author here, Claudia, who's in the audience today. What we're able to show is for every 20-minute difference in physical activity between people, the risk of diabetes goes down by about 15%. So you don't have to, do, you don't have to become a marathon runner to avoid diabetes, you just have to do more. And the more you do, the less the risk. There are many dietary factors associated with diabetes as well. For every difference of a can of Coke between people, the risk of diabetes is different by 20%. That massive differences in risk, which in, in, it has implications for how we uh, think about dealing with the problem. But what about if we try and put this together? Can we find subgroups of the population who are particularly prone to these environmental factors because of their genetics? Well, this is a tricky thing to do. So what I've done here is put people into quartiles of that genetic risk score for diabetes. And as you go across these groups, the risk, this is risk over time, is going up. And in black are the people who are obese, the blue are people who are overweight, and red those who are uh, normal weight. And you can see that actually the risk within strata is going up. Actually, it goes up steepest in this lowest group. So the relative risk increase is greatest in the thin people. But you don't set out to do prevention on the basis of relative risk. You do it on the basis of absolute risk. And you might say, well, we want to treat everybody who's got a risk of diabetes with an individual approach to prevention if they fall above this line of risk. And what you can see is everyone who's obese is above that line, irrespective of their genetic risk. And nobody who is uh, normal weight, whatever, however strong their genetic risk, ever gets to the level where individual prevention would put them at a the sufficiently high absolute risk to justify that. So right now, the, the message here is that there isn't an overwhelming uh, case for finding specific subgroups of the population for targeted prevention on the basis of these genes. That doesn't mean it won't be possible with other genes or with other behaviours in the future. But this argues for whole population approaches to prevention. The next question is, what are they? So we've known for many years that if you take people with pre-diabetes and randomise them and compare them to placebo, if you randomize them in, in blue to a lifestyle intervention, the, the risk of progression to diabetes is halved. That's a very important clinical message, but that comes from a clinical trial. So what do we achieve in the real world? Because clinical trials tell you about efficacy, but the real world is about effectiveness. And there's sometimes a gap between that, and the gap can be very big. And here's an example of that. Here's an example from an American rollout of this trial where they compared participation in this lifestyle intervention compared to not doing it, and it looks like there's a 20% reduction in risk. So not as good as 50% in the big trials, but still pretty good. And if you engaged in the lifestyle advice in an intense and sustained way, there's a 33% reduction in risk. That sounds not bad compared to 50%. The problem is this, is that the number of people who are eligible for this was 1.8 million. Actually, only 13% of people did it at all, and only 1%, a tiny proportion, did it in an intense and sustained way. And the big challenge for us is how do we take knowledge that we can achieve individual prevention and turn it into a reality? And there are people in the audience, uh, fellows admitted today, Melanie Davis and Simon Griffin, who are leading research programs trying to do that. And as yet, we have an English National Diabetes Prevention Program, which is in play, but we don't yet know quite what the difference is between the efficacy you see in trials and the real-world effectiveness uh, that we really want to achieve. Whatever we achieve in that is not the answer to the problem by itself. It's a contribution, but it needs to be complemented by other uh, approaches. And that other approach is to try and move really upstream and to, to try and realize the, the vision that Jeffrey Rose put forward in his book about preventive medicine, which is that you achieve most 
by not aiming your prevention efforts at the small group of people at high risk, but at the whole population and making small but achievable changes in everybody. And that means moving away from thinking about individuals, but thinking about uh, people in the context of a much broader sociological and ecological model. This is a, not the version that I should have showed, but it, Margaret Whitehead, who was also admitted as a fellow today, is the, uh, the architect of a, a very seminal work on, on, on the important determinants of health. And that, that requires a different type of evidence base. We are very used as physicians to thinking about an evidence base that's primarily based on trials and that we, sh we shouldn't advocate action until we have very strong trial evidence. Uh, that isn't going to work for this type of problem. Um, so we have established a center 10 years ago to try and understand the determinants of diet and activity at the population level and to evaluate interventions. And that means doing a different type of epidemiology. So all of us, when we drive between home and work, will pass takeaways. And on, in average, in leafy Cambridgeshire, where I work, uh, our participants pass 32. There are some people pass as many as 165. And the ma majority of these are actually away from people's homes. And if you quantify and put people into quartiles of exposure, so these are the people passing most takeaways, they, are, they have a massive difference in body mass index. Now, that's, a, that's greater than the biggest single gene we know. So, um, this uh, obviously is not proof of causality, but it has given rise to uh, uh, evidence that has been used in some parts of the country to argue against the proliferation of takeaways and to say there is a disbenefit to allowing a McDonald's in your neighborhood. Of course, the evaluation of these things can't be a randomized controlled trial. We have to use a different type of approach. It would, it's impossible to randomize countries or jurisdictions to a sugar levy. But it is possible to observe an impact of sugar levies on consumption to show that people are, are, are drinking less uh, sugar-sweetened beverages, and then not to directly observe an impact on health, but actually to, to model that. And our group are, are currently involved in the, uh, the evaluation of the sugar levy that was introduced by George Osborne. So I just want to return to the notion of the global prevalence and the nature of this problem, because I spoke about 600 million people having diabetes by 2040. Um, if you count out the number of people with pre-diabetes, there are 316 in 2013 and 471 million by 2035. Now, if 80% of the people in the world with diabetes are living in countries that can't afford to treat it properly, the idea that we can medicalize and treat our way out of the problem of another half a billion people having prediabetes uh, is not, in my view, sustainable. And we need to develop an evidence base for this sustainable change in societies around the world to try and deal with this problem in a different way. Because I started my talk showing you that, as clinicians, we think of diabetes as a clinical manifestation of a pathological problem. But when we're in a public health realm, we have to see this as a public health manifestation of a societal problem, and it needs that type of solution. So I've been fortunate uh, to stand up here today. Um, I've collaborated with great colleagues in the Institute of Metabolic Science, but above all, I have uh, the pleasure to work as part of a team, and what I've showed you is really the product of that team science. Thank you very much. <laughs>